Greetings all. Welcome to another session here of TESOL Methods and Materials. Today we're going to be talking about form-focused instruction. In other words, working with uh, the uh, the syntax, the grammar of language when teaching. We're going to talk about the place of grammar, some issues related to it, some grammar techniques and sequencing. First thing we're going to talk about is the place of uh, grammar when we're teaching. Um, when you look at the teaching of language, there are three primary aspects. There's the form and structure, or the grammar component of language. That's where students learn how all the nuts and bolts and how everything gets fit together. There's also the semantics, which is the vocabulary, the meanings behind all these nuts and bolts and what they, what they, uh, you know, what each element means. Uh, and then there's the pragmatics, putting that meaning in context and how all of these things fit together after they're all put together to form some form of meaning. All three are necessary for language. No one is sufficient. And so grammar, like semantics, like vocabulary, like pragmatics, like all the skills that are involved, is one of the essential components. So it behooves us to also spend time uh, teaching this. Now, there are going to be some who say, well, maybe we shouldn't teach, you know, to teach or not to teach grammar and how much focus should we put on it. As I mentioned before, there are those that would disagree that we should be teaching um, grammar. Grammar is something that's just kind of imbued and you kind of learn it through uh, being in the environment, through osmosis, as it were. Um, if you're a follower of something like the natural approach or a crash and, uh, a crash and follower, you would uh, be dissuaded to and be including grammar. Um, I, I would want to use this. Again, I'm an eclectic. I'll use uh, both sides of the spectrum. Um, I do believe that with kids, you're going to have less focus, less attention on it because they have less ability to uh, have an abstract reasoning, to uh, analyze and observe uh, language components. Uh, older uh, people, uh, they're going to have that ability. They're going to be, ha be able to analyze language and look at the components of it. And because they have that ability, you might as well take advantage of it. There are also people and places in the world where they expect to study uh, grammar. There are some people who prefer to know what the components are before they start using them. Um, it's a, Obviously, it's a dichotomy that you're going to run into with people all over the place. Again, I would be the eclectic and say for kids, you apply less attention because they have less ability to deal with it. With older people and with adults who have... You know, the, the cerebral critical thinking uh, faculties take advantage of those skills and allow that to be done also. Don't do it exclusively. So I would say it's okay to teach um, and use. Just uh, be mindful of motivation as you're doing it. The other question, of course, is what to teach. What elements do you teach and in what order do you teach them? Um, and I would recommend two things when you're going to be teaching. Teach things that are... Um, easy for the learners to understand, okay, so deal with the simpler ones first, Still deal with the less complex one, ones later, and the other thing you want to do is is those that are more usable, more used uh, grammars you want to teach first. So high frequency grammar rules and grammar rules that are easier for learners to acquire are the ones that you should be focusing on. Bear in mind that it's easier for a, uh, someone to learn these grammar rules may not be the same for everyone because of their first language. Uh, there may be differences that make it easier or more difficult. Um, if you're working with a, a group that's all from the same uh, primary culture, then you can also focus on global problems, problems that almost everybody from their culture has. Uh, so you can work at it that way. As far as teaching uh, deductively or inductively, whether you're doing incidental or deliberate, whether you're doing input-based or output-based, again, I would recommend do them all. Uh, do top-down and bottom-up processing. Uh, do incidental learning, where you're just learning and it just happens to be something. And do deliberate learning, where you actually set aside time to do some grammar, uh, grammar analysis. Do input-based and do output-based. Force them to do something. Uh, to show that they actually uh, have studied and know. All of these are going to be necessary but not sufficient. And so, again, you want to be eclectic and you want to try to play with both input and output, both inductive and deductive, both um, incidental and deliberate. Again, that would be my opinion. Some issues about teaching uh, grammar. One is age. As I mentioned earlier, younger kids have less faculty for analyzing and observing language, so don't focus on it. Spend more time with the inductive. Spend more time with the incidental. Um, 
and the implied learning of grammar, uh, similar to what uh, Krashen might say. Uh, when they get older, however, they have those they have those mental faculties. Take advantage of them. It's a tool that now you can use. Um, so that would be one thing. Proficiency is going to be another. Um, obviously, students that have lower proficiency uh, are going to be able to understand less, so there are fewer building blocks that you can deal with. When you're dealing with students that are very proficient, they don't need grammar, so you don't need to focus on that. Um, so what do your students need, and how does their proficiency impact what it is they, they might be able to do. Their education may play a role in it as well. Uh, are they, do they already have a sufficient education from which they can steal background information in learning grammar? If they do, that's a plus. If they don't know how to read their first language, reading their second language is going to be more difficult because they don't have that background knowledge. Their language skills as well as well as their first language is going to play a role. Some people are better at learning language than others, and of course some languages are closer to English than others. In earlier sessions of this uh, lecture series, I pulled out a list of um, uh, languages and the, the number of hours that it would take for them to learn English. If their language skills and their language first language is closer, it's going to be easier. Finally, what are their needs and goals? Uh, for the most part, we want to teach a well-rounded, holistic approach to language uh, training. There are times, however, where um, there are specific needs that students have and it requires a greater attention on, on grammar. Uh, so you need to find out what the goals are of these students. It may be that they don't want any, you know, some, some of your students, maybe their primary reason is because they want to go to, you know, they want to go to Hawaii and go surfing. They're going to spend a month there and they want to be able to interact in the hotels and train systems. They don't want to learn grammar. They want to be able to communicate those, those uh, finite areas so that they can get in and get out and enjoy themselves while they're there. So at that point, you, you're not gonna, probably not going to focus on grammar too much, right? As I said before, should it be talked inductively and deductively? The answer for me would be yes teach them both, do top-down and bottom-up. Should teachers use grammatical terms? I don't know what uh, the CLTs would say. I would say absolutely. These grammatical terms allow you, especially again the older levels, these grammatical terms will allow you to discuss language. Uh, and so it's just vocabulary like anybody else. Um, I do find it interesting that uh, we want to teach vocabulary, but we want to teach these vocabulary because apparently they're not uh, as popular, but I think we should uh, be using them so that we can speak uh, metalinguistically with our students to get them to think about what they're learning. Uh, should it be taught in a grammar-only session? Again, it's going to depend on the student needs and the student perceptions. There, again, there are some cultures that actually assume they're going to be teaching, they're going to be learning grammar, and not having it is something that disturbs them. <laughs> Uh, for the most part, however, for, for, language, uh, for language teaching, uh, it's better to teach grammar within a, a uh, meaningful context. Uh, so they're reading something or they want to write something and within the reading there's vocabulary that they don't know. Or there's a writing that they want to do and they don't know how to put it together. And then there's opportunities to jump into grammar. So it's more of a teachable moment type of thing. But again, there are times where you want to separate out and have a session or an activity that's uh, grammar focused. How should you correct uh, grammar? My primary thought would be motivation is the key. Um, are they going to be motivated if you correct their grammar or not? Um, my, my belief is that you want to correct their grammar both their written grammar and their spoken grammar, but you need to find ways to do it so that you encourage them, not discourage them. I believe we've talked about error correction uh, in the past, earlier in this series, um, but you could do things like recasting or asking questions. Um, you could also focus on the grammar problems that are more easily fixed and are more global. Okay? High frequency grammar should be things that you'll want to fix. Grammar that, like if you have many students that have this similar type of error, that's one to, can't, that's one to uh, focus on. Don't kill motivation when you're trying to get to a better accuracy. You want better accuracy, but you also want to keep them motivated. Keep them coming back. Uh, so, some ways that you can teach grammar. One, uh, some of these that uh, Brown listed are things like charts, objects, and maps. Um, I don't know about you, but I love the Azar series. Um, 
Azar has developed a number of books called the Grammar Books for uh, basic, intermediate, and advanced level students. They have wonderful charts that actually picture a timeline and how it's used um, in, uh, in, in perspective so that students can actually see these pictures and see where they are, where they were, and how these uh, time elements actually work. Excellent, excellent work by Azar. Um, you can have drawings and dialogues. Di in, within the dialogues, you can have highlighted in the text what the grammar, major grammar components are, uh, and then written text. So there are a number of techniques that you can be using to try to show students uh, where the grammar is. Obviously, you can use some of the more traditional things like drills, sentence, uh, you know, item replacement, that kind of thing as well. Um, that's actually more out of context. It would be better to do things that are more in a context. Sequence. How do we sequence the grammar? A curriculum that is based on the complexity of the grammar or the frequency of use. Again, I would say both. High frequency vocabulary should be, should be the focus of, of the sequencing. But at the same time, ones that are easier to teach, and that's going to depend on the students, and their first language, the the uh, ease of use of the of the grammars as well. So I would pick the ones that are easier to use first, as well as those that are more frequently used. Okay, so that means the order isn't necessarily the same. <clears throat> I would do the frequency of use first. Okay, it's also very wise to put in your grammar elements um, into your scope and sequence. Now let me be let me be clear when I say when you're teaching grammar you're not going to be able to teach every component simply too many there and there are some that you know researchers have actually difficulty describing but there are many things that you can teach it's what I would call pointillism I call it toozy pointillism I can teach this and this and this and this and the student eventually is going to have to fill in those gaps that I can't uh, cover within a class but I want to have those uh, elements covered and then put them in the sequence so that I can see well during this week or dur in this level or during this lesson we're going to focus on these these uh, these uh, lex these uh, syntactic elements so that I can be sure to cover them and then I can assess them later and see if students are learning them see if I have to go over them again or not so sequencing is in is important and make sure that you also include it in your scope and sequence the flip side of um, forum-focused instruction is vocabulary. I mentioned there are four skills, reading, writing, listening, speaking, and there are two databases. Those two databases are grammar and vocabulary. And uh, so vocabulary is the other element that students need in order to function with all the skills. Um, question, do you do incidental learning or in intentional learning? Again, I say the answer is both. We want to be able to do incidental learning Whenever, whenever it's possible, make sure things are around so students can happen to learn uh, when they're in. But also spend time with intentional learning. Research has clearly shown that without intentional learning of vocabulary, students are not going to progress nearly as quickly. I also find it interesting that the L1 is the same way. We don't, uh, in, in the uh, junior high and high schools, we do not have uh, simply incidental learning of vocabulary. Every week there's a vocabulary test in some in a lot of English classes because we want to expand that. Students that are getting ready to go to college, they start taking SAT courses and they learn all this new vocabulary. It's intentional learning. We should do the same thing uh, with, uh, with the L2. We continue to do the incidental. Again, we want both sides. We could also do things with corpus linguistics. And corpus linguistics is a whole field of, of uh, vocabulary study where we look at not only the the uh, words themselves, but how they are related to other words and how they work in conjunction with other words. Uh, we could also do things with concordancing so that we can have students learn the meanings of one word with an, uh, another word. Uh, it's always good to encourage students to shy away from those bilingual dictionaries. And you can do that with, um, with uh, concordancing or collocations. When you're in class, allocate time for vocabulary learning. And uh, this is an area where I believe, yes, we want to, the students to do this in class. And yes, it will require the teacher um, to be there. There are a variety of activities that you can do to help students master the vocabulary. According to Ellie Hinkle, 
uh, you language learners need, I think it was between 6 and 12 times, they need to come across a word in context to push it from short-term memory into long-term memory. So we want to help the students learn, we want to help them learn it in context. We want to try to wean them away from uh, the scaffolding that they may be using, for example, uh, bilingual dictionaries. I remember students who were reading academic college texts and they would start writing little notes in their first language into the textbook. Okay, This was a cheat for them so that they could follow along. Now obviously when you're dealing with college level it's very high and there's a lot of things going on there but I would try to encourage them find definitions and meanings that are available in the second language in English and that way you have a double or a triple uh, type of uh, word relationship that you can use when you're when you're learning these new words. Encourage students uh, to learn vocabulary uh, learning strategies so that they can continue learning even when you're not around. They can become independent learners. Also take advantage of teachable moments. When you're in the middle of a class and someone's asking about a word or a phrase, you can go ahead and put them up there. I remember uh, teaching classes where students would ask a question about whatever and okay, let's, let's add this to our list of new words. Um, they weren't on any any of the standard lists, but they were words that students were interested in because it happened to be there at the time. So teachable moments is a good thing. That's all I have for a form-focused instruction. To be honest, this should be a completely other class, this one course. Um, hopefully, uh, you'll be able to take a course later in uh, language arts. We'll be able to study this a little more uh, in-depth. If you do have any questions regarding form-focused instruction, grammar, or vocabulary, please let me know. I'll be glad to talk with you. There are a number of good places online where you can also get information, the Complete Lexical Tutor, um, and uh, other places online is the only one that's popping into my head right now. And uh, later on during, the, during uh, uh, another session, I'll be able to show you some of these websites. Have a nice day now. Talk to you later.